Hello, Gerald. Hello. Hello. Oh, hello, Judith. Yes. Hello, Gerald. Nice to see you. But, yes, we'll meet again tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope the I'm day after. Up. Sorry. <laughs> My goodness. Well. Well, how are you, Gerald, since we we have a couple of minutes? Well, you know, we're carrying on. And you? Much the same. We've had freezing weather like you have in England. Yes. Yes. So but today is the first day that it's warmed up. Yeah. And it's, uh, but it was very cold up till yesterday. Fearful here too. Yeah. yeah. But it'll be over. And soon spring. <laughs> Hope so. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Well, I don't know. There seem to be lots of others on this, but 163. Hi, Gerald. Oh, hello, Yasu Yogo. Did go this. Hello, Yasu Yogo. Hello, Yasu Lina. Yasas. You're a fine pair. You remember the conference, Parallel Lives, Creed and Cyprus? Yes, indeed. 15 years ago or so? Yes. Uh. More. <laughs> 15, yes, it was 15 years ago, yes. You had said the exact same thing, that's why I, I, I'm really? saying this. <laughs> yes. Oh, I, <laughs> I, I remember can't. these things. <laughs> oh. Well, we have an entertaining thing on Wednesday evening. Costis is, uh, has organized sending around to various supporters of the BSA bottles of a very fine Lirarakis wine. So ah. it's going to be a wine tasting on Zoom. <laughs> well, that's a nice idea. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, England. <laughs> that's a good idea. Sure, you are going to enjoy it. I hope so. Yes, it's sitting you in the will. Yeah, quite. But heaven knows when I'll get to Crete. <laughs> Me neither. I don't know. <laughs> I've been there in August, though. I should complain. I was there in August for a few days. Yes. Yeah, you told me. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But just for a week. Yeah. Let's see what happens this Easter or summer. Quite. <laughs> Macari. Macari. So, you, oh, they're about to introduce you. I must probably switch off when the time comes. Okay. Oh. Yes, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> Γεια σας σε όλους, όσους βλέπω και δεν βλέπω. Καλησπέρα, Γιώργο. Καλησπέρα. Good evening, everybody, those who I see and those who I don't see. Καλησπέρα. But, uh, hello. Mm Let's wait for another two minutes and then we can start, Yorvo. Yes, okay.
Okay, Costandine, we are ready. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third Zoom, lectures, Zoom, Zoom lecture of the 55th public lecture series, celebrating 30 years of research at the Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus. It is my pleasure to introduce our tonight's speaker, Associate Professor George Papasavas, one of the oldest members of the Department of History and Archaeology and of the Archaeological Research Unit. George Papasavas teaches classical archaeology at our institution since 2000. He studied prehistoric and classical archaeology at the University of Ioannina in Greece. He continued his postgraduate studies in classical archaeology at the University of Würzburg in Germany and received his doctoral title from the University of Athens, having completed his PhD research on ancient Cypriot and Cretan bronze working. His dissertation was published as a monograph by the A.G. Leventis Foundation in 2001. George has excavated at the Sanctuary of Zeus at Dodona at the settlement and cemetery of Xoburgo on Tinos, and at the sanctuary of Hermes and Aphrodite at Semiviano in Crete. He also worked for the archaeological service at Athens between 1998 and 2000. Dr. Papasavas is the coordinator of the postgraduate program of studies Mediterranean archaeology from prehistory to late antiquity, and has served as vice chair of the Department of History and Archaeology of the University of Cyprus for two years and as chair of the same department from 2013 to 2018. He participates or has participated in a number of research programs, such as the multidisciplinary project ENCOMI, a site at the forefront of technological innovation in metallurgy and artistic excellence in metalwork, funded by the University of Cyprus, and numerous other research projects funded by the EU and the Cyprus Research and Innovation Foundation. His research interests include metalworking of the Late Bronze Age and Early Iron Age, the relations between the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean in the Late Bronze and Early Iron Age, Greek sanctuaries and cults, votive offerings and ritual cult and cult rituals, and metalwork of the Aegean and Cyprus in the Late Bronze and Early Iron Ages. He currently works on the publication of the metal finds from the Sanctuary of Hermes and Aphrodite at Semiviano, on the stratigraphy of Encomi and the history of the excavations at the same site. He has published several articles and chapters in edited volumes on a wide range of topics, such as bronze artifacts from Cyprus and the Aegean, on the iconography of the ingots in the Eastern Mediterranean, on writing instruments from Crete and Cyprus, on the technology of Minoan gold singet rings, on votives from Cretan and Cypriot sanctuaries, on Iron Age terracottas from Cyprus, on late Bronze Age antiques used in the early Iron Age, on the value, circulation, and use of copper in Cyprus and the Mediterranean in general, on bronze finds from Encomi, and on rituals related to the deposition, abandonment, and the formation of the archaeological record. Tonight, we will attend another fascinating lecture to conclude the first thematic unit of this semester series. Yorgos will take us on a journey through the Eastern Mediterranean markets in the late Bronze Age, discussing the prices and values of metals. Here, I would like to let you know that your microphones are muted and your cameras are switched off during the presentation in order to avoid uh, potential disturbance. And um, we welcome Yorgos. Uh, we look forward to hearing to his lecture. Your microphone, you will be able to unmute your microphone and uh, set your camera on again after the presentation if you want to address any question directly to our speaker. Uh, you can also use the uh, chat function on at the bottom of your screen. So, Yorvos, off to you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Thanasi. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen first. So, mm -hmm. I hope you can all see it. Yep. Everything is fine. Good. First of all, good evening, everybody. First of all, uh, I want to thank you for joining us for this uh, event and for the whole series. Uh, it's, I really appreciate that you are here with us tonight. And uh, because the reason of this series is to celebrate the 30 years of the Archaeological Research Unit, let me just say how privileged I am. That's how I feel to be a member of the Archaeological Research Unit. I know that most of you, all of you actually, know exactly uh, of uh, what I'm talking about. You have come in earlier years to Cyprus. I hope the days will come again that you will be able to come back to Cyprus or for us to leave from Cyprus <laughs> one day also. So thank you very much for uh, being here tonight with us. <clears throat> Let us start. In the early 18th century BC, King Samshi Adad, a warrior who had conquered his way to the throne of Assyria and created a vast but short-lived Upper Mesopotamian Kingdom, prepares for war and all orders two high officials to plunder the bronze artifacts sealed in the tomb of one of his rivals, King King Yachtun Lim, once ruler of the prosperous kingdom of Mari on the west bank of Euphrates, that had also been seized by Shamshi Adad. The Assyrian king knew from state records that these bronzes weighed 500 kilos, and his plan was to melt them down and use the metal for the manufacture of 10,000 spearheads for his armies. His officials anxiously informed him that others had entered the tomb before them, leaving behind only 15 kilos of bronze, and that they should obtain the, obtain the necessary copper from elsewhere in exchange for silver. It is perhaps no coincidence that some of the first appearances in ancient sources of exported Cypriot copper under the designation of Alassian copper come from no other place than Mari and date probably to the reign of Yachtun Lim. What this story seems to reveal, besides the apparent royal greed for copper, is the importance of this metal for political and economic purposes, even for conquest and territorial expansion, as well as the importance of Cypriot copper in particular for ancient economies already in the mid Bronze Age. By the late Bronze Age, the island had entered the international trade networks and Cypriot copper was feeding most of bronze, most bronze industries of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East. In fact, it has been claimed that political relations and the economy of the Eastern Mediterranean in this era would have been very different without the success of Cyprus in meeting the demands of Egyptians, Levantines, and many others in metal. At the same time, intensified external demand for Cypriot copper had a profound impact on socio-political developments on the island, as the copper production had to develop in scale, administrative complexity, and technology to rise, up, to, rise to the needs of the international markets. Within this framework, Cyprus appears to have produced and distributed vast quantities of copper. The enormous scale of copper circulation left distinct traces in the archaeological record, mainly in the form of a large number of oxide ingots found dispersed in the Mediterranean and beyond, as well as in contemporary Near Eastern and Egyptian sources, such as the Amarna letters. The magnitude of this trade is best captured at the ship that sank at Ulu Burun near the end of the 14th century. This vessel, exceptional to our eyes, but probably not a one of case in its own period, carried the astonishing quantity of 10 tons of copper, mainly in the form of oxide, oxide ingots that are chemically consisted with separate copper ores, as well as several tin ingots weighing one ton. Textual evidence from Egypt and the East further witnesses to the extent of the circulation of Cypriot copper. In the Amarna letters, for instance, 
The king of Alasia is the only ruler corresponding with the pharaoh who sends copper to Egypt. The same letters recall that a total of about 1,000 ingots, the equivalent of almost 30 tons of copper, were shipped from Cyprus to Egypt during the reign of Akhenaten in a short period of less than one generation. Although this might sound like a very large amount, it corresponds to about three copper shipments like that of the Uluburun ship. Within the international networks of the Eastern Mediterranean, the different resources and products of each region could be effectively distributed and exchanged only because the value of the traded goods was measured and precisely defined in advance according to weight, volume, and material, and these measurements were subsequently accepted by all trade partners. Late Bronze Age Cypriots, which have found themselves in the position to adopt some of the interaction strategies and administrative mechanisms employed by the royal courts of the surrounding regions, such as gift exchange, the exchange of diplomatic correspondence, the ability to read and write an international script and language, such as the Akkadian cuneiform of the Amarna letters, besides their own language, as well as some standardized means for accessing the value of desired commodities. The exchange of metals at the immense scale demonstrated by the Uluburun ship, as well as the rich archaeological and textual evidence for the use of standardized weights of metals and the establishment of relative values and equivalencies for the assessment of their value, raise important questions related to the commercial value or buying power of copper and its impact on late Bronze Age economy. One such question concerns the value of copper when traded in international markets. Second important question is how many bronze objects could smiths make with such enormous, enormous quantities of metal? Let us start with the first question. Since there is abundant textual and archeological evidence that Cyprus was actively engaged in official exchanges of raw materials and finished goods with Egypt, Anatolia, and the Near East, it is reasonable to suggest that at least some of the goods that enter the Cypriot market from abroad, such as gold, silver, ivory, or other exotic items and raw materials, were exchanged for copper, and to assume that these goods must have come with a specific value, that is what we call with a price. Although we know some of the goods demanded by the King of Alashia in exchange, such as silver and luxurious furniture, linen textiles and scented oils, horses and chariots, we are not aware of the mechanisms used to calculate equivalences of value between copper sent to Egypt from Cyprus and goods flowing in the opposite direction. Different economic configurations in each area would affect prices, but Cypriots must have come in contact with the mods used by their trade partners for measuring and standardizing value and would have probably sought to comply with their economic practices. This necessity is implicit in the balance weights used in the late Cypriot period that seem to correspond closely to various metric systems and standards with a widespread circulation in the Eastern Mediterranean. The conversion of values according to material and weight was a rather simple process based in effect on a weighing koine in the Eastern Mediterranean which would have helped to build up confidence between suppliers and consumers. Thus, even if we are unable to see things from a Cypriot perspective, due to the lack of readable written evidence from the island, we can and should at least look at them from the Egypt Egyptian or Near Eastern points of view. The concept of, of value requires some definition. Value is not related only to the economic worth of things, but more significant, significantly to their social and symbolic significance. It is a social construct based on judgments that people make about some things as a consequence of their desire to acquire them. These desires closely related to the material properties of valued things and to other features, such as their provenance, accessibility, association with specific cultures of people, and with their potential to be substituted for other valuable objects. This means that objects or materials acquire value 
when as societies choose to use them as markers of wealth, power, and prestige. Nothing epitomizes these qualities of value better than metals, and in particular, gold, silver, and copper. All three were from very early on, closely associated with the concept of value because of their allure and shine, their durability and potential for eternal convertibility, as well as their adaptability to various function, functions. They were universally desired and could be used for the manufacture of a large variety of artifacts. They could be hoarded, recycled, and converted at will, or used for the accumulation of wealth, or in exchange for each other, or practically for everything else. Information on the relative values of metals and their use for exchanges in a barter system is provided by textual evidence from Egypt, Anatolia, and the Near East. Cyprus, just as the Aegean, completely lack this kind of evidence. And although there is no proof that Egyptian or Near Eastern exchange practices and concepts of values would necessarily be endorsed on the island, this quest around the Eastern Mediterranean for relevant information is perhaps warranted by the fact that Cypriots were actively participating in the international trade, trade networks and exchange systems. Several Eastern sources record a wide range of exchanges and commercial dealings, such as states dominating international transactions, large-scale mercantile ventures by wealthy merchants, personal profit, and small-scale daily sales and purchases between all people. Common to all this was the systematic application of exchange rates and equivalences of traded goods with reference to some standard units and weights in order to assess their economic value when they were changing hands. These standards range from staples, such as rations of bread and beer, to some extensively used standards expressed as weights of metals. What this means is that standardized weights of silver and copper, and to a lesser extent also of gold, were given specific values in relation to each other and were then used for the estimation of the value of other goods. Merchants were able to quantify equivalences based on these weight units and precisely calculate profits. In fact, the main contribution of metals in ancient economy was precisely their accounting function. Ancient economies are often described as monetary systems without coinage, meaning that metals were given monetary value and function as indices of value for other goods. Silver, in particular, had a remarkable purchasing power as a standard across the millennia. Prices came to be calculated in weights of silver already in the third millennium BC, when in a revolutionary move that was to change the markets forever, the principle of equivalency was developed. This principle is the foundation of any means of calculating and expressing value, and is what allows for exchanges to be materialized. This meant, for instance, that a day's work or a volume of grain or a quantity of textiles were each assigned a value of silver in terms of weight and were then exchanged accordingly with each other, that is, not necessarily with silver itself, but with an equivalent amount of a different product whose value was also calculated in silver. In other words, this means to get a price to, on, a, on a product. But there is a problem here. Because of its high value, silver, as well as gold, were not suitable for daily economic transactions and for small-scale purchases or for wages. Copper, as a base metal, on the contrary, could be better adapted to this role. And in Egypt in particular, copper often appears in calculations of prices in different levels of economic transactions. In regard of small-scale local exchanges, the inscriptions from Deir el Medina, the village of the workmen who built the tombs of the pharaohs in Thebes, provide invaluable information on exchange rates for a large variety of commodities and services and reveal the importance of copper in the transfer of ownership. Everything in Deir el Medina was evaluated in quantities of copper using a measure of weight called Deben, weighing 90, 91 grams. One Deben was subdivided in 10 Kedet, each weighing uh, nine 
0.1 grams. Using these standards, PIP in Del Medina acquired various goods in exchange for others, which had been evaluated against each other and whose prices were invariably calculated in metal. For instance, a pair of sandals cost one or two deben of copper, that is 90 or 180 grams of copper, the same as a four meters roll of papyrus. In Egypt, when it came to more expensive purchases, copper was still used for establishing prices but prices were then translated into weights of silver. In a well-known papyrus from Ramesside, Egypt, for instance, the value of a female slave was established at four deben and one cadet of silver, meaning 373 grams of silver, but this price was paid in several copper vessels and clothing items. Although it is a tri tricky task to establish the equivalences and conversion rates of metals in the late Bronze Age Eastern Mediterranean, further Egyptian, Hittite, and Near Eastern documents offer important information on this matter. As expected, these sources reveal that the relative values of metals often fluctuated substantially depending on time, place, and and special conditions, such as political stabilities, proximity to metal sources, and cost of shipment, sudden inflows of metals in the markets or depletions of their sources. Although there are many problems and uncertainties, this evidence can at least lead to some considerations on the value of Cypriot copper, if not at its place of origin, then at least at its place of destination. Egyptian sources from New Kingdom, Egypt, define the value of gold as roughly double the value of silver. That is, Egyptian equivalents for gold to silver to copper were settled at one to two to 200. Prices and equivalences, however, were considerably different than to Garit in the 14th to 13th centuries BC. Royal administrative archives from the palace and the houses of wealthy merchants inform us that the Ugaritic rate for gold to silver to copper was established at one to four to 800, meaning that pre pre precious metals were considerably more expensive there in relation to copper. Back in Egypt, the exchange ratio of copper to silver decreased in the 12th century from one to 100 to one to 60, whereas the exchange parity of copper to gold initially rem remained stable, but then also dropped at one to 120. This reduction indicates a depreciation of silver, possibly associated with a sudden influx of this metal in the market, which would have led to a corresponding increase in the value of copper. In a similar way, in Babylonia in the 13th to 12th centuries, the equivalence of copper to silver was fixed at 1 to 90, meaning that copper had become more expensive there as well. These fluctuations would obviously have been very beneficial to the Cypriot copper industry and the apparent prosperity of the island, especially since the 13th century and later in the 12th and 11th centuries, despite the political disruption and instabilities in the Eastern Mediterranean, could be related to these circumstances. On the other hand, additional evidence from Egypt reveals that copper was utterly undervalued in comparison with precious metals. For instance, the dedication relief at Karnak that commemorates the booty from the campaigns of Tutmosis III in the Levant provides an official classification of relative values for various materials graded by price and places copper at the bottom end of the list below gold, silver, and semi-precious stones. This and other epigraphic evidence further expose the massive inequality between the relative values of precious and base metals, apparently the result of their divergent material properties. In Cyprus, this difference in the relative values of gold and bronze, and consequently, in their significance as markers of high social status is most evident in funerary contexts. To give only one Cypriot example, 
tomb 93 Ancomi, the richest late Cypriot tomb, and the one with the largest amount of gold ever found in a single assemblage on the island, contained gold objects weighing in total 1,430 grams, but not a single bronze object. The disproportionate values of precious and base metals always meant that relatively small quantities of gold or silver would have been exchanged for much larger amounts of copper. Indeed, Cypriots in the Late Bronze Age had access to relatively small amounts of precious metals, and they usually had to confine themselves to small items of minimal weights, such as some frail cups and bowls, and light pieces of personal ornaments, such as gold strips, bracelets, rings, and earrings. To give only a few examples, most of the late Cypriot gold diadems weigh between 1.3 and 5.5 grams, whereas a gold ball from Ancomy weighs 176 grams, and an inscribed silver cup from Hala Sultan Teke only 160 grams. For an illuminating comparison, the three insignificant foreign wives of Tutmosis III had taken 8.5 kilos of gold jewelry in their grave. In other words, the king of Alashia may have had the diplomatic privilege to call the mighty pharaoh brother, but it is unlikely that he would have ever received such an enormous amount as the 564 kilos of gold that Pharaoh Akhenaten sent in the 14th century to his other brother, the king of Babylon, for a diplomatic wedding. It must be emphasized at this point that the relatively restrained import of gold on the island, whether as a raw material or in the form of finished objects, was still economically advantageous for Cypriots as it conveyed notions of exclusivity, prestige, and social distinction. But how can we start making sense out of such juxtapositions of amounts of copper and precious metals? Since we know the equivalences between gold, silver, and copper in one of the endpoints of these exchanges, that is Egypt and the Near East, one thing we can do is to wonder how much gold or silver could a copper cargo like the one carried by the Luburun ship buy? Before we proceed, a short note. Using terms such as prices of metals or market, trade, and buying power inevitably leads to the query whether such abstract concepts had any application in ancient times. Since the days of Carpolani and Moses Finlay, various scholars have claimed that ancient societies were completely lacking any notions of markets and mercantile activities and that any association with a market economy should be denied even to advanced cultures such as Egypt and Mesopotamia. This discussion is, of course, a derivative of the long-standing debate between formalists and substantivists in economic theory, centered around the question whether some diachronic and omnipresent principles, such as the pursuit of profit, govern human economic behavior throughout history, as argued by formalists, or if economists exclusively depend on specific ideologies and historical context, as claimed by substantivists. Earlier and recent work has deepened our understanding of socioeconomic conditions in the Eastern Mediterranean and has provided innovative approaches of ancient economies. The documents from the old Assyrian tra trading post of Kanesh in Anatolia that the, recall the commercial ventures, loans, and profits of some very successful merchants in the early second millennium BC, or the evidence from the Amarna letters and the Deir el Medina texts from New Kingdom Egypt have revolutionized our understanding of Asian economy as they demonstrate that profit was a primary concern in commercial transactions. The Assyrian merchants who transferred and sold metals and textiles in Anatolian markets were securing for themselves profits reaching as high as 100 or 200% in the sales, accumulating huge capitals in silver. In the Amarna letters, the king of Alashia also expresses a very realistic concern for making profit 
out of the island's strong position as a producer of an internationally desired raw material. Any further discussion depends, of course, on the definitions of the relevant terminology. It becomes perhaps easier to contextualize the concepts of price, value, and profit in antiquity if we accept the description of money by Monroe, and I quote, money, money provides a medium of exchange. It stores the value of something perishable in a more stable form, standardizes value of, of or prices of goods and services, and it facilitates the accumulation and accounting of wealth, end of quote. This concept of money is closely linked to the use of precisely measure, measured quantities of metals as synthesis of value, that is, of weight standards for the quantification of metals. Despite regional variations, these standards made sense around the Eastern Mediterranean basin and the Near East, where people were acquainted with the major weight systems of their commercial partners and could readily compare values and calculate profits. This is evident in the fact that at least nine different sets of weights could be present in a single context that is on the Uluburun ship. This reference brings us back to our point of departure, the copper cargo of this ship and its value. By using simple weight equivalences, such as the Egyptian rate of gold to silver to copper, at one to two to 200, we can infer that 10 tons of copper aboard the Uluburun ship would be equivalent to some 50 kilos of gold or 100 kilos of silver. Alternatively, if we use the Ugaritic equivalence of gold to silver to copper at one to four to 800, then 10 tons of copper would be exchanged for only 12 and a half kilos of gold or for 50 kilos of silver. A similar exercise has been done by Monroe, who has converted the copper cargo of the Uluburun ship in Ugaritic shekels of 9.4 uh, 9 grams each. In accordance with the evidence that near the end of the Late Bronze Age, the price of one kilo of copper in Ugarit was established at about half a silver shekel, that is about five grams of silver, he estimated that the copper ingots from Uluburun were the equivalent of about 5,327 shekels of silver. How can we make sense of this particular context and its place within the economic realities of the international markets in the late Bronze Age? To do this, we need to assess the profit margins and opportunities for those who could dispatch such a large quantity of metal and the price that the receivers at the other end of the line were expected to pay in return, assuming as a matter of convenience that such cargos were meant for one recipient and that they were to be exchanged for gold or silver rather than for any other goods. To use, to use some specific archeological context, we can estimate that if the amount of 1,000 430 grams of gold contained in Enkomi tomb 93 was to be acquired entirely in exchange for copper, then according to the Egyptian ratio of gold to copper at one to 200, this quantity of gold would have been traded with approximately 286 kilos of copper or about 10 oxide ingots of 28 kilos each. If we instead use the Ugaritic ratio of gold to copper at one to 200, then the same amount of one and a half kilos of copper would have been exchanged for 1,144 kilos of copper, transcribed to about 41 oxide ingots. Incidentally, this latter weight is only nine kilos short of the actual copper cargo of another ship that sank at Cape Helidonia around 1200 BC. This vessel also carried tin ingots and several copper oxide ingots, also chemically consistent with the Cypriot provenance, whose weight has been recently recalculated at 1,135 kilos. At the other end of the scale in Egypt, if the amount of 8.5 
kilos of gold deposited in the tomb of the three foreign wives of Tutmosis III was theoretically to be exchanged for copper at the Egyptian ratio of one to 200, this transaction would have required about 1,700 kilos of copper or more than 60 copper oxide ingots. In Ugarit, and according to the ratio of gold to copper at one to, to 800, a total of 8.5 kilos of gold would be equivalent to 6,800 kilos of copper, rising to about 2,043 copper oxide ingots, that is more than two thirds of the Uluburun copper cargo of 10 tons, and about six times the copper cargo of the Cape Caledonia ship. As a further example of how the values of metals could be materialized for exchanges, we can use the two silver ingots deposited around 1200 BC at Pila on the south southeastern coast of Cyprus. These ingots were not just reserves of raw materials for the manufacture of silver objects, but would have represented a store of convertible wealth ready to re-enter the economy at any time. Each weighs about 1.3 kilos, and their total weight of 2.6 kilos would be worth of about 520 kilos of copper in the markets of Ugarit, corresponding to 18 oxide ingots, according to the ratio of silver to copper at four to 800. It follows that the copper cargo of just over 1100 kilos of the Cape, uh, Cape Caledonia ship red would be worth in these markets of only about four such silver ingots, whereas the entire copper cargo of 10 tons of copper of Uluburun could be exchanged for approximately 38 silver ingots as the pillar ones. Such amounts of similar silver ingots would easily fit into one or a few small baskets or sacks. It was apparently much lighter to travel around with gold or silver in your luggage than with the bulk copper cargos required for exchanges. A co comparable example is offered by a 14th century hoard from Amarna, which consists of 23 gold beads weighing close to four kilos in total, and another kilo of silver fragments contained in a clay jar. Using the conversion rates of the 18th dynasty, that is gold to silver to copper at one to two to 200, this cash corresponds to about seven and 84 kilos of copper, the equivalent of 28 oxide ingots or about 70% of the Cape Caledonia copper cargo. And all this fortune was contained in just one small jar. To illustrate this point further, a merchant could replace the entire copper cargo of Uluburun that included 354 oxide ingots with about 33 30, 333 silver armlets as this example from Engomi weighing about 150 grams. Apart from weight, volumetrics also made it easier to travel with silver if you had it, rather than with large quantities of copper. As to the relative quantity, uh, value of the two objects shown here, one such armlet in Ugarit at the ratio of silver to copper at four to 800 would be equal to the full ingot. In Egypt, at the ratio of silver to copper at two to 200, it could buy half the ingot. By the same token, turning to gold for similar deductions and contrasting the weights of this particular copper oxide ingot and of a thin gold strip weighing just over four grams, and applying the Egyptian ratio of gold to copper at one to 200, we reach the conclusion that this, this amount of copper would be equivalent of uh, 184.6 grams of gold. Consequently, an ingot as this one would purchase the raw material for about 45 such gold strips. This is not negligible at all, actually. The situation with gold and its economic relation to copper is very intriguing. 
Egyptian gold was highly valued and internationally desired. In the Amarna letters, for instance, gold is the subject of constant requests and protests by various wealthy rulers to the much wealthier pharaoh. Egyptian records of gold reserves and endowments associated with the state and temple treasuries in the Hugh Kingdom are astounding. Just three pharaohs, Hatshepsut, Moses III, and Rapsons III, had offered to Karnak alone the sum of about a quarter of a million gold deben, which means several tons of gold, perhaps as many as 22. Most of this gold remained in Egypt, in the temples and royal treasuries, but large quantities were also sent abroad on various occasions. What was, what was the commercial value of this gold and silver, more specifically in relation to copper? For the sake of discussion, if a large amount of gold, let us say, such as the 564 kilos sent to Babylon by Akhenaton in one shipment, was all to be bartered for Cypriot copper with the Egyptian exchange rate of gold to copper at one to 200, then Cypriot bureaucracy would have had to dispatch a convoy of 11 ships, each loaded with the same copper cargo as that of the Uluburun ship. This enterprise would amount to about 4,000 oxide ingots, translating to 113 tons of copper. And uh, you can check my maths here if you like, in the black uh, the numbers written in black, uh, the maths simplified. You can check to see if I'm correct. If for some reason, Cypriot merchants were compelled to use the ugaritic ratio for gold to copper at one. 800, then they would have had to, to assemble an armada of 45 ships, such as the Uluburun vessel, and load them with about 16,000 ingots, corresponding to 450 tons of copper. Both figures were, of course, exceeding the capacities of any single Cypriot king, not to mention that they would have rather quickly depleted Cypriot copper sources. To be sure, no such quantities of copper were ever to be dispatched in a single ship shipment. And besides, gold and copper were, of course, not exclusively exchanged for each other. These unrealistic numbers, based as they are on real values and equivalences of metals, serve not only to demonstrate yet again the huge difference between the relative values of precious and base metals, but also to place the different economic capacities of each region in perspective as well as to reveal the true caliber and capacity of late Cypriot economy when compared to those of the great powers such as Egypt or Babylonia. For some more pragmatic but equally astronomical calculations, we can est estimate that according to the Egyptian ratio of gold to copper at one to 200, the weight of the 11 kilos of gold used for the mass of Tutankhamun would be equivalent to 2.2 tons of copper or about 70 oxide ingots. This amount corresponds approximately to one fourth of the copper cargo of Uluburu or about two times the cargo of the Cape Caledonia ship. However, if one was to do business at Ugarit at the equivalence of gold to copper at one to 800, then 11 kilos of gold would be equivalent to 8.8 .8 tons of copper, which correspond to almost the entire copper cargo of 10 tons of the Uluburun, or about eight times the copper cargo of Cape Caledonia. And again, you can check my maths here. The computation of the relative values of the gold used for the inner sarcophagus of Tutankhamun, weighing over 110 kilos, results in even more striking numbers. If we use the New Kingdom ratio for gold to copper at one to 200, then 110 kilos of gold would be equivalent to 22 tons of copper or close to 800 copper oxide ingots. That is more than twice the copper cargo of the Uluburun ship. If we move to Ugarit and calculate according to the ratio for gold to copper at one to 800, the same amount of gold would be equal to 88 tons of copper or 3,154 ingots, 
that is almost nine times the copper cargo of the Oluburun ship. I must emphasize once more that I'm not suggesting that metals were exchanged only for other metals. Other products and materials such as timber or grain were involved in local or international exchanges as also documented in the Oluburun ship that also carried among other things, glass ingots, ebony logs, ivory and terebith tracing canonite jars. These configurations are only meant to highlight the purchasing power of copper in, in relative terms in international markets and the extent of the power of Cypriot kings for negotiations. It must also be pointed out that these calculations do not refute the importance of copper for international trade and political relations. Despite the imbalance in the relative values of metals, copper remained an important international medium for economic transactions and the matter of international diplomacy and political alliances. Nor do they indicate that copper was a cheap merchandise. One needs only to consider the investment in time and manpower required for the production of metal in bulk quantities. The mobilization of large numbers of people in the mines, the metallurgical installations, the ports of export and aboard the ships, as well as the absorption of occasional losses of the cargoes in the sea, such as at Uluburun, must have certainly come with high costs. But why was copper so important for economies worldwide? Besides its use in, in bronze workshops, copper had in the later second millennium BC acquired an importance as a currency, that is, as a standardized measure of value. In local and international exchanges, measure quantities of copper were used as a standard to assess the economic value of other commodities or to pay for them. As already mentioned, in Egypt, the prices of products and services were standardized by weight or volume and were commonly calculated in copper as a stable point of reference. In this way, one could be paid in grain for a service or a product, but his payment was expressed as a specific quantity of copper. It is thus interesting to investigate the buying power of copper when it came to the purchase of services and goods other than metals. To do this, we need to contextualize the value of copper by comparison to specific economic indices related to subsistence, such as wages or a month's supply in grain. As documented in the text from Deir al Medina, an Egyptian workman was paid a monthly salary of 5.5 cars of wheat. Car was a unit for the measurement of volume equal to about 77 today's liters. His payment would be in grain, but the value of this grain itself was consistently calculated and transcribed in an equivalent amount of copper. Workmen were consequently registered as paid in wheat worth of 11 copper deben and as one deben equals 91 grams, this means about one kilo of copper. Men of other professions in the Medina, such as scribes or foremen, earn seven and a half cars per month, that is about 15 deben of copper, which obviously, obviously gave them a considerable purchasing power, more than enough for covering mere subsistence needs. Thus, for a decent sarcophagus, one needed an average of 25 copper deben, that is just over two months' work, and for undecorated version of the Book of the Dead, about 15 copper deben, that is one and a half months of work, although a decorated Book of the Dead would cost about 100 copper deben, or about nine months' work. It is important to, be, to, to remind here that metals themselves were not necessarily used for payment, but as currencies and stable points of reference for establishing value in barter transactions. On this account, and if we were to record the economic significance of Ulu Burun by referring to wages, we could estimate that the payment for 10,000 workmen for one month, or else the payment for 833 workmen for one year was virtually contained and lost in the Uluburun ship. This was indeed the titanic economic disaster, not just for common men, 
but also for whatever royal court dispatched or was awaiting this cargo. Continuing along the same lines, and given that the price of grain in New Kingdom Egypt was established at two deben of copper per car, which means that 182 grams of copper were equivalent to 77 liters of grain, we can infer that 10,000 kilos of copper on the Oluburun ship could have fed a huge number of people. More specifically, 10 tons of copper could purchase in, in Egypt 423,000 liters of grain. Since the monthly stipend of 5.5 cars for an Egyptian workman has been calculated on other grounds as more than adequate to sustain a family of 10 for a month, it follows that the copper cargo of Uluburun and its worth of 423,000 liters of grain could have fed 76,009 nine, 909 Egyptians for a month. This translates to food for 7,690 families of 10 for a month. To put the same numbers in a different perspective, grain exchanged for the cup, copper cargo at Uluburun could have fed 6,409 people, meaning 640 families of 10 for a year. Due to the differences of prices, the same copper cargo could purchase an even higher amount of grain in Ugarit by about 11%. I will spare you the arithmetic here, but this copper could pay for food for 7,253 men, meaning 725 families of them for a whole year in Ugarit. Another thing one could do with such enormous quantities of metals was politics. I do not mean, to mean only the requests for metals in the diplomatic correspondence amongst the royal courts of the late Bronze Age. I mainly refer to the importance of metals for warfare and military expeditions in a variety of ways, including the manufacture of weapons, taxation and booty from conquered lands recorded in metal sums as well as the forging of political alliances. Nikmadu, king of Ugarit in the second part of the 14th century, consented to pay to his southern neighbor, Aziru, king of Amuru, 5,000 5, shekels of silver for political alliance and military protection. As a silver shekel weighed 9.4 grams, this amount was equal, equal to about 47 kilos of silver. From this point of view, the 10 tons of copper on the Oluburun ship gain a deeper perspective as this amount of copper was according to the Ugaritic ratio of silver to copper at four to 800, the equivalent of about 50 kilos of silver in Ugaritic prices. Apparently, it took one shipment of copper to keep up balances in the region. Let us now very briefly turn to the second question we asked a few minutes ago, that is on the types and numbers of bronze objects that smiths could produce with large quantities of copper circulating in the late Bronze Age Eastern Mediterranean. This query relocates our attention from the issues of production and circulation of metals to the aspects of their conversion into artifacts. It explores, that is, the various ways in which metals were consumed and redistributed as finished items, re-entering society across all levels, from the highest as prestige objects to the lowest as tools and utensils. Important information for this discussion is provided by two types of evidence, one textual, the other archeological. Both take us this time away from Egypt and the Near East and into the Aegean world. The weights of copper allotted to smiths and the numbers of manufactured items recorded in Linear B tablets from Knossos and Pylos, as well as the weights of actual bronzes from Mycenaean Greece and from Cyprus, offer some insights on the numbers of objects that could be made if one had unlimited access to copper and tin. In the JN tablets of Pylos, each smith sparingly received 3.5 kilos of copper or bronze on average, meaning that a single ingot 
could be fragmented and rationed to as many as eight craftsmen. Such an amount was apparently adequate to keep a bronze workshop busy for some days. There was at least one extremely important use of copper alloys in massive quantities for which there was no substitution before the Iron Age. Bronze, that is, was enormously important for the ever increasing demand for weapons, such as swords and daggers, spear and arrowheads, scale armors, helmets, chariot and horse trappings. For this purpose alone, vast amounts of, of copper were distributed across the Mediterranean over the millennia. Thousands have survived an archaeological record, and although they are not as often mentioned in Eastern sources, it is exactly with such objects that Mycenaean Linea B tablets referring to metals are mainly preoccupied. For example, at least 110 out of 138 tablets from Knossos refer to high numbers of weapons and armor, such as 78 corslets, 213 daggers, and 8,640 spear and arrowheads. If we combine in our calculations the number of 50 swords recorded in one of the swords tablet from Knossos with the weight of 370 grams of a bronze sword such as the one shown here, we can infer that the smiths responsible for this delivery at Knossos would need about 60% of an oxide ingot weighing 28 kilos. A full ingot would have produced about 82 such swords. Important information for this matter is provided by actual finds of weapons when evaluated against the evidence for the supply of their raw materials. For instance, the quantities of 10 tons of copper and one ton of tin containing the Uluburun sheep could produce 10 tons of bronze. This total amount could then be used to cast the astonishing figure of 25,000 swords such as these exams from Encomi, weighing on average 450 grams each. This means that the single oxide ingot could produce as many as about 65 of such swords. 11 tons of bronze would also result to around 30,000 swords of an earlier and lighter late Minoan type on the basis of such an exam weighing about 370 grams. With these figures in perspective, such numbers of weapons would have been more than adequate to equip the Egyptian army of, of 20,000 men that fought at the decisive battle of Kadesh against the Hittites. The Uluburu metal cargo would also be sufficient for the fabrication of more than 105,000 spearheads, such as an example also found in this wreck, and weighing just over 100 grams. Let us remember that the Assyrian king, Samshi Adad, had planned to plunder a royal tomb in the hope to obtain just half a ton of bronze, that is less than 5% of the Uluburun cargo, so as to manufacture 10,000 spearheads of a light Syrian type weighing about 50 grams. If this king threw an anachronistic twist had the Ulubrum copper cargo at his disposal, he would have been able to cast 220,000 such spearheads. To move away from military concerns, the same cargo could deliver about 77,000 chisels, such as an example from Ulubrum weighing 143 grams. It would also enable the production of almost 30,000 bronze double edges like this from Encomi, weighing 374 grams. Alternatively, it could be used for the manufacture of about 30,000 bronze lag edges of about or about 20,000 double axes, as the exams shown here. It is important to note that these calculations do not rely on prices of metals, which may be different from time to time and from place to place, but only on the evaluation of the weights of late Bronze Age Finnish artifacts, which are not affected by price fluctuations. In any case, they serve to highlight the importance of copper, hence of Cypriot economy, not only for royal courts and temples, but also for the soldier, the farmer, the carpenter, the builder, the miner, and the smith. 
An additional point of interest related to the consumption of copper is that the price of or value of a metal object did not necessarily need to be the same as the value of the metal used for its manufacture. The value of the metal itself was never lost of sight as it could always be converted back to raw material. But the craftsmanship involved in their manufacture was also important for assessing the value of finished artifacts. We know this from some texts that present a discrepancy between the listed price of an object and the value of the metal used for its creation as expressed in weight. In some cases, prices for finished goods actually suggest that the cost of labor was high. For example, an Ugaritic text refers to the trade of a silver bowl for the price of 80 shekels of gold, although its recorded weight corresponds to only 65 shekels of gold. The remaining 15 shekels of gold, or close to 20% of the final price, were possibly meant to cover the cost of the craftsmanship. In another case, in Egypt of the 19th dynasty, the value of bronze razors is listed, is listed as one to two copper deben, which means 90 to 180 grams of copper. Since actual razors from this time weigh between 30 and 80 grams, that is less than one deben of copper, it seems that the recorded price does not refer to the weight of the metal, but to its total value, including manufacturing costs. Although this evidence from Egyptian and Near Eastern written sources should be read with caution, especially in view of economic variants such as price fluctuations, and it cannot be directly applied to Cyprus, it does, however, open a window in the wide world of Eastern Mediterranean trade and helps to assess the island's position there. Perhaps one day, the Cypriot administrative archive, preferably with documents in a read up script and language, will help us to learn more. Until that day, we can only appreciate why the monarchs of the late Bronze Age Mediterranean had to rely so much on Cypriot copper if they wanted their armies to continue marching, their farmers to continue farming, their builders to go on constructing, and they are nobles to continue offering lavish offerings to their deities. Unlike precious metals, bronzes were available in their so many different forms to all levels of society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Giorgo. This was a fascinating and informative insight uh, into uh, late Bronze Age economy and the value of metals uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. The view from uh, Egypt and Ugarit uh, has been very infor informative indeed, uh, producing valuable clues, I would say, uh, on, on the value of copper with many meaningful implications, uh, especially on the interpretation of uh, the dynamic uh, and not just economic dynamic of specific sites in the Eastern Mediterranean, especially Cyprus, uh, copper producing Cyprus. Um, and you have been very brave, I have to say, with all your logistics. <laughs> <laughs> it's not one of my, uh, my best qualities, but <laughs> Lina also checked my maths for me. So I oh, hope they are good. right. And I hope you were not uh, oh, well, intimidated sure. by these huge numbers, like uh, millions of, <laughs> of tons. <laughs> I'm sure people interested in, in this aspect especially will check your logistics so they will come back if they find something odd, uh, which I don't think so. Anyway, we have many, uh, loads of our attendants attendees today are people, people we know they work in Cyprus and they've all of them expressed their enthusiasm and their thanks for your lecture. Uh, Congratulations by everyone. Uh, I'm just checking quickly for potential uh, questions written on the chat function. Uh, so please, if in the meantime, there is someone who wishes to address a question or comment directly to yours, you can unmute now your microphone and honest, uh, your uh, comment. Excuse me. Sava. Maybe there is something wrong with Savas's microphone. Uh, anyway, 
Uh, yes, so please do uh, use uh, your microphone and camera to address um, a common question to yours. I'm just checking on the chat. Um, yes, the first question comes from Alan Williams. What was the relative price of tin in different places and did it change over time? Do we know any, uh, anything about this? Well, it is, it is very strange. Thank you for this question. It is very strange that we don't have enough information from the East on the price of tin. We do have some information, but not as much as we have for uh, precious metals and even for, for copper. Uh, the information that we have also suggests, of course, fluctuations in price from the early second millennium to the latter part of, of the second millennium, for example. Uh, but it seems that in general, uh, it was of a similar price uh, as copper. So they were very uh, similar, their equivalences, uh, so copper could be exchanged as one to one uh, with copper, but it's, it's, it's a bit odd that uh, the, the textual information that we have uh, for uh, the um, uh, tin, for prices of tin in, in uh, ancient documents, uh, is not suffi sufficient not to cover it and to, to, to see all the fluctuations and the, the ups and downs in the prices as we can do with uh, copper. But uh, in general, that's, that's the main trend that it was a more or less uh, the same price of, of, uh, as, uh, as copper. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Jorgo. Um, the uh, but of course, on the on the sorry, and on the other hand, in Anatolia, yeah. for example, uh, the Assyrian merchants were making huge profits selling tin uh, in Anatolia, tin they had brought from Assyria, where they had gathered it, and where the price was cheaper, and they made, uh, according to the text, uh, profits as high as one hundred percent because the price of in Assyria was so much different than in, in, uh, in Anatolia, uh, they were making this huge uh, profit. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a comment from Carol Bell, who says, uh, glad you use the Ugaric texts, which have all sorts of goods, including. Uh, she also, uh, yeah, she also adds donkeys. Uh, I presume she would <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. donkeys and cattle, and there were many. Hi, Carol. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Absolutely. So, so fascinating. Um, Thank you. Uh, the, 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 the donkey question is uh, very interesting because, of course, they were the pack animals to move the tin. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Were, they could carry. Uh, well, maybe we should put uh, also Cypriot donkeys in the equation. They were also. <laughs> 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 very good at uh, transporting very heavy loads over long, long uh, distances. So they were valuable in that respect. Also in Cyprus, big, bringing the uh, metal. I, I, I think I'm right in saying as well, there were different types of donkeys. The donkeys that were capable of carrying metal as a heavy loads, as opposed to carrying textiles, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. So there we are, that's a side show. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Carl. There's a question from uh, Christoph Christomir. Um, is there any information on the rate, uh, on the exchange rate between copper and ivory? Uh, I have not come across any such information. We don't, because uh, even in the texts, uh, because ivory was not used for ex for exchanges in the same uh, level as metals were used. So we don't have this information as we have for copper being used as uh, to purchase something and the equivalence it was evaluated, was the price, it was a price uh, computed in, in metal weight. So um, ivory does not make this uh, this level. Uh, it was so much uh, rare, uh, so we I didn't come across any uh, such information on the uh, relative price of uh, ivory uh, as opposed to 
uh, metals. There are for textiles, for example, but I didn't come across any. I'm sure there, there must be something, but I didn't find any. I didn't search for it, so I didn't find it. Mm -hmm. I was only looking for metals, actually. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, from Love Ericsson. How rel reliable are written sources for fluctuations of prices in metals and finished crafts? Is there a great discrepancy between sources written at the, at the same time or depending more on region? Actually, we don't have a, we have a discrepancy from, from sources from different periods. That's how we know that there was a fluctuation. But in general, uh, the documents that we have from one period each time, they are very uh, precise and uh, what they mention does not uh, cause many problems. I mean, the fluctuations are there, but they, are, they depend on various things. But at the same period, always we have from, from various texts, which of course are not economy. It's not that they give us, they describe us uh, in theory, how much uh, kill of, of gold, gold or silver uh, was worth off. They, they present us with sales and purchases, so in a very practical level. And uh, in Del Medina, for example, you have all these thousands and thousands of inscriptions. I think there are um, more than um, 20,000 inscriptions. And they're not from the same period, but they cover more than two centuries, I think there. So that you can follow uh, their, their fluctuations, but uh, you can really see that there is, in general, um, uh, they, are, they are very, um, uh, these uh, calculations that they do, they are very precise. We don't have any big problems uh, there. Things we do not know is why these fluctuations happen, because sometimes they do happen suddenly. And one of the reasons is, uh, that one of the reasons behind this could be the sudden influx of, of uh, a raw material of gold or silver in the market. For example, it has been uh, assumed that uh, uh, in the 12th century, uh, the price of silver drops uh, and of, of gold because there was an influx of uh, silver and uh, gold in the market from robberies in the tombs of the kings. Even, even at the state level, even that the pharaoh had order for, uh, for this um, plunder of uh, royal tombs because he needed or they needed the silver and the gold. And that meant that a lot of metal came into the market, meaning that the price dropped. It's exactly what uh, maybe have happened in the later fourth century BC, when after Alexander captured the treasury of the per uh, Persians and flooded the market with uh, silver and gold, uh, the prices dropped also. So that's a universal phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, let, us, uh, let us listen to the Amadis Panagiotopoulos who would like to address a question and then we get back to Jana Smith next and other questions on the chat. Yamandi. Well, uh, Hi, Yaman. Uh, hello, Yorgos. And hello. thank you very, very, very much uh, for you. this uh, very insightful lecture. Well, actually, uh, Joanna Smith's co comment uh, uh, has anticipated my question, which is very similar. Um, well, mo most of, uh, of the data we have about the equivalent, equivalence of uh, metal prices are based uh, on uh, transaction in a domestic context. Mm -hmm. And uh, thinking that uh, um, someone could exchange uh, in, uh, in Ugarit gold with copper uh, and get copper in a quantity which is four times higher than the transaction between Cyprus and Egypt, if uh, this transaction would have taken place according to the Egyptian equivalence of metals. And this is what your, this dramatic discrepancy between the, the Egyptian and the Ugaritic equivalence shows. 
which doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. If someone goes to Ugarit, can fetch gold, uh, bronze, which is four times higher in quantity than in Cyprus, following the Egyptian equivalence of metals. The only, the only way to explain uh, these dramatic discrepancies is to assume uh, that these equivalences we have uh, were uh, uh, operating only in a domestic and not in an international context. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Well, uh, first of all, that was a discussion that yeah, I had to take out of, of my uh, talk because of time restrictions and because it is a big and huge issue. And there are many things that need to be said in that respect. One thing is that it is true that uh, the kings and rulers and monarchs of this period do not seem to be very interested in precisely measuring uh, the amounts of, uh, gold, of uh, goods and commodities they are exchanging with each other. Uh, they never specify, I'm sending you this amount of copper, so you have to send me exactly this. You know this very well. Uh, but this, on the other hand, does not mean that they are, do not care about exactly what they are going to receive because each time when they don't ask for it, they don't say, I'm sending you a send me so much. But when the, the Egyptian, the pharaoh or somebody else sends something to them, at least that's something we get from their manual letters, they always complain that it's not enough it is not as much as your father had sent me. And the quality is not the same because when we melted down, the, the, it, it, it wasn't pure gold or something. And it's not much. And I sent you that much and what you sent me is not enough. So they, they apparently care very much about quantities, but they don't care to express themselves in that respect. Of course, the Amano letters is only a fraction of the letters which must have been coming and going in, in both directions. That's the, the one thing we need to say. On the other hand, the local exchanges did not take place according to these ratios, actually, because the uh, 11, uh, one kilo of, of, um, of copper is nothing in gold. <laughs> you, can just, you cannot just give one gram of gold or 10 grams of gold for a wage, you cannot have that. So these salaries and these wages were not paid in gold, we were paid in copper. So it doesn't apply actually there. They did not need the calculation there. They didn't have the, the, the money uh, in, uh, in the gold or the silver in their hand, but they had to calculate accordingly. That in my mind says there was an official there an official regulation, an official ratio, which they could not really follow practically because they didn't have the gold or the silver, but it was there. On my mind, it, it means the exact opposite, that they had some uh, official regulations that, that they were uh, regulating according to them. And after, the, after all, they were using the same, the exact same weight standards that we don't have any discrepancy between a local, local exchanges, small scale exchanges, and state level exchanges. They use the shekel, they use the mina, uh, and so on. So, so um, it is a big discussion, but in my mind, it, it, it kind of proves the exact opposite that uh, they uh, really uh, had to uh, follow uh, um, an official, let us say, uh, uh, standards in their exchanges. Mm -hmm. They could not really pay anything or buy a pair of sandals in gold. Just a, a very brief uh, second question. So do you think that when the Egyptians acquired uh, bronze from Cyprus, uh, did they do it uh, on the basis of the Egyptian critic ratio? Yeah, that's another question because a, a, a simple also and very reasonable question would be why buy uh, copper, uh, sorry, gold, uh, in Ugarit, if you can find it so much cheaper in Egypt, that's also part of the first question I forgot about it. 
uh, it doesn't make sense. If you want gold, you go to Egypt. You, don't, you do not sell to Ugarit because that's going to be far more expensive. But it's not as simple as that because first of all, uh, it seems that um, uh, Egyptians were guarding their gold very, uh, they don't, they were not allowing as much gold to leave the country. We have a lot of, of reference to that, that various rulers ask for gold pressingly and uh, they don't receive the gold and they write to Akhenaton, for example, uh, the king of, uh, of the Mitanni, I think, uh, that uh, your father had sent me much gold and you didn't send me anything or you only sent me very little and send me again and uh, please do send me because you have so much. So it wasn't uh, that easy to get your hands on Egyptian gold. And uh, so uh, you had to, to deal with wherever you could find it. And uh, if you could find it in, in Ugarit, maybe where it was exported from Egypt, you would buy it there if the Egyptians would not give any more. Um, anymore to you. So this all played a huge role in these transactions. We don't know them very well, these circumstances, but I think um, it was a very lively trade. And in all these situations, what the motivation behind all these transactions was uh, profit, the pursuit Thank of, of Thank profit. You. Thank you. Um, May I come into that, if I may? Sure. Um, this is John Sardis from the United States. My belief is that the value of gold was predicated by how close gold mines were to the country. For example, in Egypt, uh, gold was procured from Nubia and uh, it was plentiful. So I would imagine that copper was not Consequently, the value of gold to copper was different from that in Ugarit because gold mines were not that, uh, uh, th they didn't have an, enough gold mines in Anatolia at the time. Mm -hmm. Consequently, I think that the value of gold compared to other metals uh, was very much predicated by the ability of that particular country to procure gold either easily or more difficult. You are very correct in that. Of course, the distance uh, to the mines uh, always played a, a big role. Uh, Cyprus is a good example for copper because the mines were just there. Uh, so it, it did play a, a role and we can see it in other metals also, but sometimes it, it, didn't, it didn't work always like that. For example, in Anatolia, there are uh, tin mines, but uh, still the Assyrians were importing tin in Anatolia. Uh, I don't know if it was more economical for, for the people there in Anatolia to buy the Assyrian tin than, than opening up the mines because that's a very expensive business to, to have a mine and produce large quantities of metals and you need the logistics and the bureaucracy and the people and everything. So maybe it's, uh, sometimes it's uh, better uh, if somebody brings it to you even over long, uh, very long distances like from Assyria to uh, Anatolia over a long caravan routes. So it's, um, uh, it an, does awful play a lot of, an awful lot of tin coming into Anatolia used to come from Afghanistan, what's today Afghanistan, where they did mm -hmm. have fairly large tin, tin mines back in, yeah. the, uh, in, in, in the Bronze Age. Yeah, that's where the Assyrians must have gotten it's relatively close in, in that region. Anyway, thank you very much for a wonderful thank lecture. You. It was most uh, interesting. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. And uh, we hope that, I think uh, you, you have answered to uh, uh, Jonathan Smith's question already. So let's move on to Nathanael Arab Satulo, who is uh, asking, do we know anything about this debasement of gold, silver? Was this something the texts are concerned at all? 
with? Yes, there is. A, we 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 can notice that there is a devaluation, the depreciation of silver, in the 12th century, and we do not know exactly why. And then many theories have been suggested um, that, uh, for example, as I was saying before, too much metal uh, uh, got into the uh, into economy, so there was too much metal there, so the price uh, dropped. Uh, this is one of the of the theories, but we do not know much uh, actually. I mean, nobody ever records it. It's not like newspapers. You get a news that you get in newspapers that today there is a drop. We just can infer that from uh, the equivalences between the sales and purchases between different metals that the price has dropped, but nobody uh, discusses in ancient texts why uh, this had uh, happened. A each time when we have, we can have the opposite, of course, that the price rises uh, during a war uh, or during a, a famine, for example, when there's not enough uh, demand for precious metal and then the prices drop again, for example, uh, or tomb looting, which was very, uh, not just in Egypt, but everywhere happening very often and um, metal was get, coming out of the uh, tombs, uh, and then it was re-entering economy as raw material, not as objects anymore. Uh, we do have this instance. And this this, this uh, situation can affect prices, uh, whether by uh, raising them or by lowering them. Uh, so we don't have uh, any precise information on these matters, unfortunately. They don't record um, economic situations like this. We only infer them out of um, out of uh, transactions, commercial transactions, and the exchange between metals. Mm -hmm. uh, another question al along the same lines by Liora Benchmul: uh, Was there a relative price for iron? And once iron entered the market, did the relative price of copper, tin, bronze decrease? Well, unfortunately, the information we have for, from the first millennium is not uh, as much as from the second millennium. Uh, so we do not know really what happened there. Uh, but of course, uh, iron was so much cheaper because it was everywhere. You didn't need, no, you didn't need to buy it. Uh, so uh, you cannot really compare. There are completely different reasons to to to, to produce and distribute copper and uh, tin. You need to have an infrastructure because copper and tin does not exist everywhere. You need to have ships to ship it aboard. You have to have diplomatic relations. You have to fix, have fixed prices and weights to calculate values and everything. So it's you, you cannot really uh, compare. On the one hand, on the other hand, even in the Iron Age, we should not forget that bronze, that means copper and tin, continue to play a, a huge uh, role. It's not that uh, copper um, lost its importance in the first millennium BC. It was equally important. There are a lot of things which can, cannot be made of, of iron, only of copper, or things that you can make both of copper and uh, uh, bronze and iron doesn't mean that you you don't have any uh, bronze weapons for example in the iron age that's another aspect of, of this uh, same question i think salim mcgrath uh, uh, is, as, uh, is asking i'm assuming the source of gold was egypt so I, I i wonder if you know what wage was paid for mercenaries in egypt in egyptian pay yeah, the source was most, uh, the, uh, the pharaoh was the most wealthy uh, ruler in gold because he had them, all the pharaohs had the mines in uh, Nubia in the eastern uh, desert. Uh, and it actually it has been calculated how many tons they were producing per year, how many kilos and eventually how many uh, tons. Uh, I do not know uh, about uh, mercenaries. Uh, I didn't find anything there. About mercenaries, there is some work done, but especially for the first millennium, I don't know of any 
uh, references in texts for the wages of mercenaries in the second uh, millennium. Mm -hmm. uh, Anastasia Dakuri Hild is thanking you for the lecture and she has a comment on the question. I think I was very interested in the differentiation between raw material value and the craft craftsmanship value for certain objects in the records. Both have economic value, for example, exchange value for the raw material, labor value for the manufacture, energy expenditure, including include, uh, needed training. Uh, what are your thoughts on other kinds of value as motivators for trade, for example, social or symbolic, and the ways in which different materials are combined to produce value in commodities that is more than just the sum of its parts? Yes, of course, but that uh, value is uh, mostly a social construct. It's not just an economical. When we talk about value for these objects, we do not mean just the value of their raw materials. We do have to add in the labor costs, which sometimes were especially high, depending, of course, on uh, what you were making and who had who the custom, customer was, who had ordered. It. So prices were considerably high, higher in some cases, and we do have some exams where this can be proven. I only mentioned two or strongly indicated, if not proven. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, all these metal uh, objects, how, no matter how uh, nice they were and how uh, of a high craftsmanship they were, eventually they could be melted and you could just get the, the, the metal out of it, even if it was a very nice uh, golden cup with uh, figures with uh, relief decoration, you could just get some, it didn't happen only by vandals in the later times, but also in, in uh, antiquity. Uh, and it was official. Sometimes, sometimes the state or the temples even did it when they needed the raw material. But of course, uh, the value of a, a metal object is primarily its social value, how it is used in society, uh, what it means. And because it, metal has have these qualities like um, durability and actually they are eternal. They can always be converted back to raw metal and uh, raw material and then other objects can be made. And this is a, a cycle that goes and goes, and never ends. And because of their allure and shine, they always had this. And because actually it was very difficult to procure them. And uh, once you had procured them, it was also not difficult, but not everybody could really make a sword or a, or a jewelry item or, or, or whatever. So it, it was this exclusivity, let us say, which always afforded, accorded metals uh, um, high status and uh, that it's why it was always associated with social uh, prestige. There was no, not everybody could have them. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are so many, still quite a few questions and comments, so I will just quickly read through uh, if you want to add. I think you have partly answered most of these. Uh, from Anne Brisbert, my th many thanks for this amazing research. Is there a possibility to see a change of value in copper, silver, gold buying power when iron becomes commonly introduced as a metal? If you have to add something to this. Uh, well, uh, as I said, there are the different different things, and we don't have that much uh, evidence from the first millennium. But uh, we have to bear in mind that these are different things because of the accessibility uh, to iron, which was not the case with all other metals, more or less, most other metals. Uh, so uh, th there was a difference uh, there, but uh, you. Iron is, is everywhere. The problem is we don't have enough evidence from the uh, first millennium. And again, of course, um, it depends on where you are looking. If you're looking in the Aegean or if you're looking in the uh, East, the Near East or in Egypt, there can be very, very uh, many differences there and needs more than one people to look at all this material. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Jorgo. I'll uh, contact you separately more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stu Sherat is asking, do we know anything about the relative prices for alloy bronze? I'm thinking about the alloy bronze scrap and ingots found, for example, on the Gelidonia wreck and all the bronze scrap that appears in this Mediterranean in the later 13th century. Yeah, um, of course, uh, you have to combine the, the buying power of copper and tin for, for the bronze. And because you have, it's not always uh, uh, 10, 10 parts of copper or and one part of tin, sometimes it's less tin, but there you can have an equivalence uh, between, uh, between the two. Uh, but sometimes, yes, you, you do have um, bronze uh, ingots, not necessarily oxide ingots, I mean, burning ingots like this. So the metal is there. Some, some, some of this metal may actually come from recycled uh, metal, uh, bronze objects, which then produce a, met, a bronze uh, ingot. Uh, but the, our information is not always very precise. For example, for the linear B tablets from Knossos and Pilos, we do not know uh, if uh, they refer to copper or bronze. It is not very clear because of the well-known problem that the Greek language, even the most in most, most ancient form, does not differentiate between, between copper and bronze has the same works, uh, word for, for, for both, even today, even in modern Greek. So we really, um, do, not, um, do not know what was going there. That's, that's a very interesting question, but this is of course has to do with a very important, the very important issue of recycling, recycling bronze, uh, bronzes, bronze artifacts uh, not destroying them, not just smashing them or melting them, but to produce metal, which was in circulation, um, especially, especially since the 13th uh, century. And I see, see Susan Sherratt is online and she, she knows so much better than <laughs> the subject. So, uh, uh, so you very uh, much. Yes, no, the, the, the problem of the linear B tablets is a big yeah. thing because we really don't know what they're talking about there. Right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Glynis folks, how do you think artisans, for example, the workers at Dir el Medina or the possible Mainoan artists who painted the Tel el Taba paid for their donkeys and other things? Uh, did they trade and barter with each other or use Deben in Egypt or other things like measures of grain? They did, yeah, they bartered with each other. I mean, there are now there's a lot of research even of um, how much was um, the cost of painting, of having a tomb painted, for example, or a sarcophagus painted or a book of the dead. I only refer very briefly to a few exams. And it was very expensive. I think it was something like 400 deben of, of copper, which was a lot of, of money for a simple decoration. So most of these people could not uh, expect to get such a funerary um, uh, expense at all. But um, yes, they were changing everything. Everything they had, they, they could have, it could be food stuff like grain, it could be, uh, clothes, it could be uh, shoes, uh, donkeys, uh, cattle, um, anything uh, could be um, could be evaluated. Have a get a, a tag, let us say, with a specific uh, price, uh, and then exchange for whatever a pair of shoes for a roll of papyrus, which had also been evaluated independently and so you could uh, you could mind sometimes if the papyrus roll was too long uh, you could give a piece of, uh, of cloth and a pair of shoes but that means that they had to have prices on them let's uh, let us say and these are these are always very it's not that anybody would set a price on what uh, or how he thought it was fair it's not about that. There was standard uh, and very precisely recorded values 
uh, according to, to the items and according to their material and their genre. Martin Odler, uh, just a remark, this is uh, not a question from an Egypt Egyptologist. Egyptologist, gold and silver could have been accessible also in private transactions in the New Kingdom annual tax. Uh, in the New Kingdom annual tax of an official in charge of nature in, in Fayum was 91 kilograms of gold. Fishermen paid their taxes in silver. Uh, and he quotes the uh, source, uh, Moreno Garcia Juan Carlos, to 2013, for anyone mm -hmm. interested in copying the uh, reference. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, Carol Bell also notes, uh, she comments that for those interested in tin prices and sources, please see pages so-and-so from Bell 2006. Thank you, Carol. And uh, yes, another remark from Martin Odler. Uh, there is a new source from Dale uh, Deir El Medina on private transactions with copper published in, and there is a, a the reference holds Regina, Newman, Michael, and others. Um, right. I think, yes, loads of comments on, you know, uh, congratulating you and many thanks from loads of people. Uh, Glynis finishes with uh, the comment, it's amazing to think of how the very high level exchange effect, ex high level exchange affected exchange in daily life. Uh, so uh, thank you, Glynis. Uh, Yorgos, uh, I think, uh, yes, we are, it's already quarter past nine. Uh, the, the, there was loads of, loads of interest on your, on your presentation tonight and we thank you for sharing all these details, fascinating details okay. with us. Um, and please let me remind everyone that uh, next Monday, we, we move to our next thematic unit, which is, yeah, we move on to the next period, the Iron Age, from the Iron Age to the Roman. Uh, our first speaker in, the, uh, in our uh, next week's lecture is by our colleague, Professor Marina ja uh, Maria Yakovu. Uh, the Tumulus of Laona is the title of her paper, An Uncypriot Monument in the Landscape of Palepafos. So we will move into the Iron Age and uh, we hope to see you all again next Monday. Yorgo, the floor is yours to close, to finish this uh, tonight's lecture. And if, if there are people who want to, to say goodbye, please feel free and uh, unmute your microphone. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to everybody. Well, it's a great thing that even during the pandemic or because of it, I mean, it has a, and it's not good to say it has a positive, but in some ways it does have, because these gatherings now, worldwide gatherings uh, are uh, very possible. And it shows us new ways of communication perhaps, because it still is a, a good way to communicate with, uh, people and friends and everybody who is interested in uh, things like this. It, it's it's great opportunity. So I would like to thank everybody for joining us in this lecture tonight. Many thanks. I see a lot of friends, a lot of faces. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's like a bouquet of, <laughs> of faces. <laughs> thank you so much for this. I, really, I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Oh, yes, we did. Everybody <laughs> did. Thank you. Many thanks. Thank you, Yorgo. Thank you, everyone. See you next Monday. See you then. on Monday. Bye-bye. Thank you.